All right, we're going to start with the, uh, the or, or we're going to finish this morning session with the third tutorial talk uh, on artificial intelligence and how it relates to this conference, neuroscience. Um, just to remind you, now that you're back and refreshed, uh, we had a nice tutorial from Weiji we started with and taking seriously behavior and a lot of the machinery just to understand behavior, which is really important. Uh, then we heard from Ruben, where we took really seriously single neurons and how they respond and uh, a lot of mathematical machinery of how to interpret it in normative ways, descriptive ways, etc. And uh, in this third tutorial, we're going to hear a little bit, something a little bit different. We're going to take seriously things beyond single neurons and ways of measuring the entire brain, specifically neuroimaging techniques. And actually, we're going to hear a little bit about things beyond vision, which is great because although a lot of us do vision, there are other things our brains do. And um, it's very interesting, obviously hard, um, and it would be interesting to see these different approaches eventually merge in maybe people thinking about doing interdisciplinary uh, approaches. I'm talking about students and postdocs and people still sort of learning their chops. So uh, without further ado, our next talk is given by Alana Fish. Uh, Alana attained her bachelor's and master's from University of Alberta, and her PhD was done in, at Carnegie Mellon under the supervision of Tom Mitchell. She is now an assistant professor in computer science at the University of Victoria, uh, Victoria British Columbia. Uh, Alana studies how the human brain processes language from machine learning, neuroscience, and computational linguistic perspectives. So please help me welcome her. Okay, good. Um, so I'll, I'll just start by reiterating what has already been said, which is that um, to do a tutorial in an hour is a, a difficult task. Um, so I've done my best to try to cover the population that we have here. There's many different interests and many different backgrounds. So I hope that there'll be something for everybody in this talk. Um, also, I put the slides up on my webpage. So uh, there are a lot of links today, as well as a lot of references to different research papers. Uh, you can scramble to take photos if that's what keeps you awake, but you're also welcome to just download the slides and see them all that way too. Uh, so we'll start with the obligatory picture of a humanoid robot um, and ask, what is artificial intelligence? Well, you probably have seen enough movies to know that artificial intelligence is the idea that at some point we might be able to get computers to, to perform uh, tasks as well as humans, to be as intelligent as a human. Um, but this is a sort of a vague goal um, because it, it's unclear that how we would know if we had actually obtained artificial intelligence. So if I gave you a computer and I said, this computer is artificial intelligence, how would you be able to test it? And so there have been multiple um, tests put forward uh, to solve that problem. One of them is the Turing test, which you might be familiar with, which is, can a computer fool a human into thinking it's human? Uh, but another one that was put forward more recently is the robot student test. So this is the idea that if a computer program could actually go to school, and uh, perform like a student does in school, then possibly that's, that robot would be artificially intelligent. So that computer would have to register for a university program, it would have to attend classes, read the textbook, do the assignments, and in, in the end, finish a degree. And if a computer could do that, then it would be artificially intelligent. And it would be, in, in fact, teaching itself, um, which could lead to this sort of uh, iterance, iter iterating on that intelligence. So I, I asked a Google image search what a student robot looks like. This is what a student robot looks like. And I, I had to show this image to you because, guys, these binders are empty. <laughs> I don't know what that means. Maybe the robot has consumed all of the knowledge. Or maybe the knowledge was never there. So there's, there's multiple possibilities here. I'll let you think about that. Uh, so the Allen Institute for Artificial Intelligence has taken up this task, and they're trying to build a computer program, they've named it Aristo, to um, uh, pass a grade eight science test. And so Aristo has available to it multiple science textbooks, as well as everything on the internet. So if you had multiple science textbooks and everything on the internet, you could probably pass a grade eight science test. Um, so you can go to the Aristo website and look at some of the questions that exist on these uh, tests. And so here's an example. So what characteristic helps a fox find food? Is it its sense of smell, its thick fur, its long tail, or its pointed teeth? Now you probably don't even need the internet or a science textbook to answer this question, right? 
Um, but Aristo needed the internet. Uh, and so he, he, he decides that it's the sense of smell. And the reason he explains his, his prediction, because he found this sentence on the internet, a wolf depends on its sense of smell to find most food. And so this is actually a, an example of generalization. We've taken the idea um, that a wolf and a fox are similar in some way. And so what a wolf does to find food is probably similar to what a fox does to find food. And it's, so it's made that generalization. So that's actually an important step in artificial intelligence, to be able to understand information beyond just what's given to you. Here's another question. Um, this question specifically involves a diagram, which is interesting. Uh, so here we have a, a life cycle diagram. Uh, if you're not familiar with these, we'll just go over it really quickly. Uh, so snakes eat frogs, frogs eat caterpillars, caterpillars eat plants, and the plants are powered by the sun. So the question is, if the population of snakes increases, uh, what will happen to the population of frogs? And so you all probably also don't need a textbook or the internet to know that the population of the frogs will go down because there will be more snakes to eat them. So Aristo has to parse this diagram. So it needs to use some form of computer vision to figure out what these diagrams are and which way the arrows point um, and what the relationship is between the entities in this diagram. And then it extracts some um, dependencies from that uh, information that, um, for example, snakes depend on frogs. And then it's from the questions, it knows that we're asking if, the chain, if there's a change in snakes such that the snakes increase, what will be the outcome? So what will be the change in frogs? And it knows that frogs will decrease. So to, to successfully pass the robot student test, we'd have to do a lot of different things. We'd have to have perception, so we'd need to be able to read textbooks and, and understand diagrams. Never mind, we'd actually have to navigate a world as well if we wanted to actually attend the classes. We need to represent knowledge, so we need to understand that foxes and wolves are two entities that have something in common. Um, and we need to be able to communicate by language. So we didn't have to do that here. All of these questions were multiple choice, but you can imagine that at some point during your university degree, you're probably gonna have to write at least a short answer question, possibly even an essay. And so depending on your program, you might have to do some actual language generation. And then there are, of course, a, a myriad of other things you would have to do to pass this test. You'd have to be able to learn, obviously. Um, reason, generalize, plan, um, a whole host of things. This would be a really complex uh, instrument if we could build a robot that could did, uh, get a university degree. So I'm gonna to structure today's talk around this robot student test and talk about three of these points. So I'm gonna talk about perception, the representation of knowledge, and communication via language. And I want to uh, start with a caveat that is, um, I am not talking about all of AI. Uh, to talk about all of AI would require it an entire semester. So there's no way we can do it today. So if you work on um, one of these uh, areas of AI that I'm not talking about today, my apologies to you. So I'm not talking about re reinforcement learning. I'm not talking about like all of robotics. Um, if you work on those things, my apologies. I see you. Your science is important. Uh, if I had more time, I would include it and definitely include it here. Another thing I'm not gonna talk about today is uh, AI taking over the world. I'm trying to preempt your question at the end about AI taking over the world. I do think it's an important question to ask and it's something that's important to think about. I also think a lot of people are asking questions about it and thinking about it. And so instead, at the end of my talk today, I'll take a few moments to talk to you about something else, or how artificial intelligence is affecting us right now. Um, so you might not be aware of it, but artificial intelligence is sneaking into your life and is having a real impact on a lot of populations um, in our world. And so it's important to think about these insidious ways that artificial intelligence can impact us without us even know knowing it's happening. So we'll start with skill one. This is perception. Uh, so perception in AI has been uh, greatly impacted by the release of one particular data set called ImageNet. So it was first released in 2009. Um, and it contains over a million images annotated with a thousand different categories. Um, and those thousand different categories are things that are general like cup, but there are also things that are incredibly specific like ptarmigan um, and other things that you'd, you'd have to look up in order to understand what they were. And then added on top of that is this concept of deep learning, which we've heard a lot about today and I'll touch on very uh, briefly as well. And these two things together have really come to change computer vision and the way that um, artificial intelligence does perception. So in case you're not familiar with ImageNet, here are a few example images. Uh, they're a little hard to see, I know, but um, here's some, for example, some uh, side view mirrors on a car. Here's some dogs down here. So you can see that there are multiple different kinds of images here. It wasn't like somebody took a cup 
to a studio somewhere and took seven images of it at prescribed angles. That's not at all what this data set is. This data set is the world as it exists if you were to open your door. This is everything you could see if you stepped outside. These are the sorts of things that people encounter every day. And so it's a very different data set than something that had been prescribed uh, and collected in a controlled experiment. There's multiple lightings, there's multiple viewpoints, there's multiple scales. In addition, there are, um, there's extreme detail in these thousand categories. Um, so I chose here some of the trees that are included in the data set. Um, I know what some of these trees are. Like, for example, I know what a ginkgo tree is. I think I could identify a ginkgo tree if you showed it to me, but m many of these trees I have, I have no idea. And I wouldn't be able to differentiate between them if you, told, if you gave me two pictures and said, which one is a uh, tulip tree? I, have, I don't know. And probably you don't know either, but the computer algorithms we're training here are expected to make that kind of differentiation, that kind of fine detail. And then even within category, there's a huge amount of variation. So this is the category for cat. These cats aren't all just sitting looking at you. Some of them are, are partially occluded by pillows. Um, they're in strange positions. So that we're actually asking a lot of these algorithms. We're asking them to do a really hard task, which is to tell the, which objects are in these images in a variety of different situations. So ImageNet, um, there's a competition that surrounds ImageNet that's run every year. Uh, and so in 2010 and 2011, the uh, more traditional computer vision approaches um, were tackling this problem, and they were getting into the mid-70s, which is respectable given the complexity of this data set, right? So this is um, not an easy task, and to so get into the mid-70s is, is impressive in itself. So they ran the experiments, the, the contest again in 2012, and didn't see much of an improvement from the traditional computer vision methods. But this year was the year that deep learning came along. And deep learning saw a full 10% improvement on this task that, that nobody had been able to break what seemed like this impossible barrier of the mid-70s. Um, so I don't know Jeff Hinton very well, uh, but I've seen him speak. He strikes me as a, your typical polite Englishman. So I don't think he's the kind of guy who would do a mic drop, but this is the computer vision mic drop to me. This was them showing up to a competition and just blowing everyone else out of the water. This completely changed computer vision. I ca it cannot be understated that what an effect this had. And then in subsequent years, the, the change in the accuracy was just phenomenal. And so now, remember that the complexity of this task is amazing, and people are getting in the mid-90s for this thousand-way classification. It's just mind-blowing. So that tells you what computer vision is capable of now. It's really remarkable, and it's, it's changed in the last five years like, like nobody would have expected. So it's used for um, a lot of things. It is being integrated into self-driving cars, and it can do the kind of segmentation that's required for these complex tasks. So figuring out where are the people in this picture, where are the buildings, where's the road, and even within a road, where are the markings on the road so that if I'm driving a car, where do I need to keep the car? So we'll do a, a quick crash course on neural networks um, and start with the idea that, like, Neural networks are inspired by neurons, and neurons take a set of input that come in through their dendrites, they sum them up, um, and then depending on where their threshold is, once they've sort of received enough information, they send a pulse forward. And so neural networks are very similar. They get a bunch of input, so we call them the X, and then we multiply each one of those inputs by a weight that's um, represented by an edge in this graph. So this line has associated with it a weight. So we multiply the inputs by the weight, we add them all up, and then pass that sum through an activation function. So we often draw these networks in this way. So we can put many of these neurons together. And so um, on one end, we have the image, the, sorry, the input, which can be something like an image. And on the other end, we have the output. So for example, something like predicting what's in the image. So here's a cat, here's a ptarmigan. So for a particular neuron, for example here H3, each one of the edges corresponds to a weight and we'll multiply that weight by the corresponding X from the input, add them all up and then send them through an activation function which is often uh, notated by sigma, which can take many forms and as Jan said yesterday, um, more popularly recently the ReLU, which is this last um, example here, which is just linear on one side, linear if greater than zero and flat zero otherwise. So in comes the input on one side, we pass it through our neural network, do some multiplying and some adding, passing it through some activation functions, and out the other side comes some um, prediction about what's in an image. 
So when we build a neural network, the architecture is fixed. So we have um, decided the depth in general, we've decided the depth in advance, and we've also decided the, the number of neurons per layer in advance. Um, and then once that network is fixed, we start with some random assignment for the weights on each one of the edges. And then using a learning algorithm, we'll update those, those weights on those edges in order to make the predictions that come out the end of the neural network better. So convolutional neural nets take the, the um, more general neural network and add a couple of different opera operations to it. So those operations are convolution and pooling or subsampling. So on one end it comes our image, and we're going to do some convolution of a filter with this uh, image. And then from those convolutions, we'll do some subsampling, and we'll, we'll loop those, link those operations together. And at the very end, usually we add some sort of fully connected layers uh, before our predictions. So the input image uh, in general would be continuous valued, but here we'll just have a, an example binary image. And the filter, again, can be continuous valued. Here we'll just use a binary filter. So here's uh, the image and the filter. And the idea is that we convolve them together. So we take the product of the um, filter on top of the image, and then we add up all of the values in order to create a new feature map. So this feature map is the convolution of the filter with the image itself. And the filters themselves are learned. So um, we update the weights in each one of the filters as part of the learning process. And the types of things that come out look like the edge detectors that we're familiar with from actual vision, not computer vision. So the output of the convolution layer is a feature map. So we'll take a, a filter that looks something like this, for example, and we'll convolve it all over the image. And we get out something that looks it's not kind of like the image, but has some different um, characteristics. And then we can take another filter and do a similar process, and we get out a different feature map. So we call these feature maps, and they're a representation of the underlying information with some additional filter on top of it. So here, in the, after a convolution, we end up with feature maps that look something like this. And now we're going to do subsampling on top of that. Uh, so subsampling takes a small patch of that convolved feature map and applies some operation to it. So we can either average together all the values in this particular patch, or we can take the max. And depending on where you went to school, you'd do a different one of those two things. So this um, pooling or subsampling gives us uh, invariance, which means that we're able to detect a cup no matter where in the image it appears and no matter its orientation, for example. And it also has the effect of reducing the dimensionality. So it, it, uh, um, makes the number of features in subsequent layers smaller. So these, these squares get smaller as the network gets deeper. And so we can think of each one of these feature maps, each one of these uh, matrices at each layer in the network as a hidden representation. So it represents some portion of the information in the original image. And because the feature maps get smaller, we can also think of it as a compression. So we can think of it as just like PCA or SVD, if you're familiar with those, uh, it's compressing the information into a lower dimensional space. And at the output, it, the, uh, the dimension of the space for ImageNet would be 1,000 dimensions, and it would be compressing the information down into just one prediction. What is the object that's in this image? So one thing that people have asked is, um, what do the neurons of the network represent? And so this goes back to the comment yesterday from Nicole Rust about um, interpretability in machine learning. So I don't think that this is being completely ignored by the machine learning community. I think it has been taken up. I think people are interested in, in understanding neural networks. And here's at least one way that people are doing this. So the question that, that we can ask is, what does this neuron J2 like? So what is it looking for in the image that would make it excited? Um, so how can we make J2's activation value as high as possible? And so in order to to make J2's activation as high as possible, we're allowed to turn up and down the pixels of the input image X. And then depending on how we move those pixels in the input image, we can see whether or not uh, J goes up or down, and we'll keep doing that until we get a J that, we get an image that makes J fire maximally. We can do this for all of the layers of the neural network, and we'll get out different um, examples of things that would make this neuron happy, we can think of it. So in very early layers of the neural network, we'll get out things that look like edge detectors. And as we move up through the layers, so for layer two and three, we get more complex patterns. We get things that look like curved edges or circles. 
And as we move up to the more complex layers, we get even more complex patterns. And so at the very top layer here, this happens to be an eight layer convolutional neural network. At the top layer here, this is actually the output layer where it's making a prediction about what it sees in the image. So we can actually label these images with the prediction that this particular neuron would be making. So for example here, uh, this is a, this neuron likes vultures. And so these pictures actually do look like vultures. And if you squint, this kind of looks like gazelles with the curvy horns, uh, mushrooms and cups. You definitely can see the things that these different uh, neurons like. So then what do these convolutional neural networks have to do with actual neurons? Um, and the idea is that there was, at some point, someone was inspired by the brain when they built neural networks. So the idea of a neural network was inspired by neurons. And it's, it's definitely diverged, but we keep having these sort of parallels between neural networks and real uh, neural structures. And one of them is this increasing um, sort of compression and higher order features as we move through visual, uh, the visual system is sort of mirrored by the layers of the convolutional neural network. So this has inspired a lot of work, including uh, from Jim DiCarlo's lab as well as Nico Kriegesquart's lab, who I don't think he's here today, but um, is he? Oh, hey. So I'm not talking about your work today. Sorry. <laughs> talking about somebody else's, because uh, his paper was this year. Anyway. Um, anyway, so a lot of people have taken this up. And um, the idea is, let's take an image and show it to a fully trained neural network. So we'll take ImageNet. Uh, train the neural network up, and then show it an image and look at these hidden representations at each of the layers. And then we'll take the same image and we'll show it to a brain that's been trained on the world and ask um, what does its representations in different brain areas look like. And then we're going to ask what is the correlation between these different brain areas and the different layers of the neural network. So once we show our image to the neural network as well as to a real neural network, a brain, uh, we'll get out a set of vectors. So for the neural network, the vectors correspond to these hidden representations at each one of the layers. And for a brain, um, we're going to get out vectors that correspond to the, the recorded activity at each one of the ROIs that we're interested in. So here they've selected seven vision-related areas. And the caveat here is that this is fMRI data. And so of course, fMRI data is not actually measuring individual neurons. Um, so we'll take everything with a grain of salt, understanding that, of course, we're measuring many, many neurons all together at the same time. So we have eight convolutional neural network layers, and we have seven brain areas. And we're going to train all possible pairs of those uh, vectors uh, in order to ask what is the correlation between these information representations. So we're going to train, in particular, a linear regression that takes as input the fMRI data and can produce as output a prediction about what the convolutional neural network would be representing for that same image. And then we ask about how um, correlated that prediction is with what we actually observe from the neural network. So if we're able to do a good job of predicting that uh, neural network's hidden representation, then the correlation, the, there will be a high correlation to the actual values. Okay, so if we look at, um, to start with, we'll look at the very low layers of this convolutional ne neural network, so layers one through four. And the first layer, um, we see very little correlation um, for these vision areas, so V1 through V4, LOC, FFA, and PPA. But as we move up through the neural network, we start to see a higher correlation to the actual representations of uh, the brain. And as we move up to the highest layers, we start to see a differentiation between the layers. So the higher order vision areas have a higher correlation to higher layers in the neural network. So there is some relationship between the kind of information that these convolutional neural networks represent and the kind of information we see in the brain. So now we'll, we'll move on to skill number two, which is representing knowledge. Um, so you, you represent knowledge in your minds without even realizing you're doing it. Um, and so it's hard to think about what it would mean for a computer to represent knowledge. Um, but to get you thinking about it, I'll ask you, um, what's something that's similar to an orange? Uh, did you say dendrite? Tangerine. tangerine. <laughs> it's like somebody's punking me over in this corner. <laughs> a tangerine, that's a great one. Anybody else? How about an apple or a banana? 
Probably none of you were thinking car. Probably none of you were even thinking sandwich, although sandwiches are, you could also eat a sandwich. And so why is that? Well, you have some representation of the world in your mind and you understand which things are similar. Just because of the way that you've, you've, if you've grown up in the world, you understand what oranges are like, what apples are like, and what cars are like. And so maybe in your mind you have a two-dimensional representation of the world. You understand how sweet things are, and you understand whether or not things grow on a tree. And so this allows you to differentiate between some of these groups. You put your fruit up in this upper right-hand corner, and you put sandwich and car in the lower left-hand corner. Because um, sandwiches and cars don't grow on, tre on trees, and maybe sandwiches are slightly sweeter than cars. It's unclear. Uh, so what this is, is a, this is called a vector space model of semantics. So in a vector space model of semantics, each one of the words is represented by a point. And we put it in a space where the vectors correspond to some idea of semantics. So here, these, vec these uh, the axes correspond to sweetness and growing on a tree. And for example, the word sandwich has a point zero comma 0 0.3, 0 0.03. And that tells us where it lives in this space. And then words that are similar, concepts that are similar, will live close together in this semantic space. But of course, you, you have a higher dimensional representation of knowledge. It's not two dimensions. You have additional dimensions. And so we'll have to build a computer model of, of knowledge that can handle these high dimensional representations. And we'll need to be able to differentiate, for example, all of the words in the English language. So we're talking about tens of thousands of points. So we're going to need, in order to differentiate them, we'll have very high dimensional space. And we can't sit down and annotate for every word what every dimension should be, as well as what the value should be for each one of the dimensions. So instead, we'll do it automatically we'll get a computer to do it. So whereas the original picture, our, each one of our words had a two-dimensional, a point in two-dimensional space, now we're gonna expand that vector to be high dimensional, hundreds of dimensions. And that will allow us to tell the difference between all of the fruit, for example, as well as all of the other different things that exist in our world. So in order to do that, we'll process a large text corpus and we'll find words that are associated with our words of interest. So if I'm interested in the word banana, um, I might notice that it often appears with the, word, the verb eat, but less often with the verb drive. And so this idea has uh, been around for a long time. Um, 20 years this year was the, one of the first papers, latent semantic analysis. Um, and then more recently, a neural network model, uh, Skipgram, uh, was invented that also takes advantage of this idea that words that are uh, similar will appear in similar contexts. So Skipgram is a neural network and it works like this. I give you a central word, so for example, the word banana, and I'm gonna train a word vector, a hidden representation for that word, that allows me to predict with high probability the words that will appear nearby. And so I'm gonna use a corpus to generate these word pairs, so I'm gonna find all, in my corpus all of the times the person used the word banana, and I'm gonna look at the neighborhood of that word, and I'm gonna to try to train word vectors that are able to predict words that often appear in that neighborhood. So the networks looks like something like this. The input here is what's called a one-hot vector, which means that all of the elements of this ve vector are zero except for the one that corresponds to the one word I'm interested in. So if my word right now is banana, I'll have, uh, for example, x2 will be the only one in this vector. <clears throat> and on the output on the other side, I'm gonna have a probability distribution over all of the possible words, and I'm gonna train it so that the values are high for, pos for words that I've seen co-occurring with my word of interest. So for example, maybe this is uh, y3 is eat and y4 is uh, yellow. So in the middle here, I have a hidden representation for the central word. So I have a representation of banana that allows me to predict the nearby words with higher accuracy. So this hidden representation we call a word vector. And these vectors have some seemingly magical properties, which uh, we'll talk a bit about now. So for example, I can use these words to solve analogies. So if you've taken the SATs, a lot of Americans in the room, so you've probably taken the SATs, um, hammer is to nail as screwdriver is to screw. screw. Excellent. Nicely done. So uh, word vectors can do this too, and it's, it's really interesting because the way the word vectors do this is, is through just, just uh, sub add addition and subtraction. So I take the vector for nail, I subtract the vector for hammer, and I add the vector for screwdriver, and it turns out that that resulting vector is actually pretty close to the vector for screw. Uh, so we can do this for all kinds of things. So for example, for newspapers, New York is to New York Times as Baltimore is to Baltimore Sun. Uh, Austria is to Australian 
Austrian airlines as Spain is to Spain Air, so on and so forth. And that's because these um, word vectors represent semantics in a way such that um, relationships exist as directions in this space. So for example, gender is, uh, exists as a direction. So if I, go from, if I wanna go from the vector for man to the vector for woman, I move in a particular direction, and it's the same direction if I wanna move from king to queen. And that's what allows me to solve these analogies. There's also similar analogies for different parts of speech or, um, or different word forms. So for example, move from king to the plural kings or queen to the plural queens, I move in the same direction. And here's an example for um, capitals and their countries. So again, the same direction is um, sort of maintained across all of these different examples. So that's what allows me to solve these word analogies. We can also predict word similarity using this, uh, these word vectors. So if I talk about word, if I talk about skip gram space, we can talk about the dimensions of the skip gram space and the, the words within that space, we'll, we can record the distances between pairs of words. So here, apple and banana are pretty close together, so they'll have a, a small distance between them, but car and orange have a larger distance. And we can also ask humans about the same pairs of words. So if we ask humans to tell us how similar are apple and banana and how similar are banana and car, they'll give us some ratings. And it turns out that there's actually a pretty good correlation between human behavioral data about word similarity and the word similarity in word vector space. So what do word vectors have to do with the brain? Um, so we'll do a, we have a similar test set up here. Uh, we'll have a neural network on one side. Here's our skip gram neural network. And here on this side is the brain again. But now, Instead of images, we'll show people words. And then as output from our skip gram neural network, we'll have only one representation. That's the word vector for the word we showed the person. And then on the fMRI side, on the brain side, we'll have uh, four uh, vectors corresponding to frontal, temporal, occipital, and parietal lobes. So very coarse uh, uh, ROIs here. So it turns out that these, in an RSA style analysis, shout out to Nico, um, we actually do see a high correlation between these vectors and the, um, the fMRI images for the corresponding word. Interestingly, not in occipital cortex, but in frontal, temporal, and parietal. So this leads us to the idea that we can actually use word vectors, uh, use the brain to test word vectors. So we can ask, using neural image data, what word vector model best matches the neural the, the brain. And so maybe that also gives us a, an idea of which are the best word vectors for some definition of best. So I've collected together a bunch of brain imaging data sets because um, if you work with anybody who doesn't collect brain imaging data, brain imaging data is actually really um, scary. There's a lot of things you have to do to get it to work properly. And so we tried to do all of that work for people in order to get them to uh, use brain imaging data in order to evaluate their word vectors. So there's fMRI, MEG, and EEG data, as well as English and Italian, uh, were uh, native English and Italian speakers, um, abstract and concrete nouns, as well as we're looking for more data sets. So if you know, any, uh, know of any and want to uh, submit them, we'd be happy to include them. And so we can ask, what is the performance of a variety of different word vectors on these data sets? And we see our friend Skipgram does pretty well here. So skipgram vectors are correlated with fMRI activity and so are a lot of other word vector models. So there is a relationship between these representations of knowledge that we glean out of large text corpuses and what we represent in our minds, in our brains, uh, for knowledge as well. So the final robot skill is communicating via language. So we need our robots to show up for tests and actually write coherent answers. And so the, the technology behind this is called a recurrent neural network. So this is a neural network that can produce language, can actually decide what words to write. So it decides what word to, to write based on the context, so all of the words it's seen so far, um, as well as the uh, previous word. So then it takes those two pieces of information and then writes the next word and then recurses. So here's our neural network. We have on the input side a word vector for the input word. And on the output side, we want to produce a probability distribution over all of the possible next words. And then to produce the next word of the sentence, we'll actually sample from that distribution. Now, if we just use the network like this, for any particular input word, the distribution would be constant over next words, which isn't really how 
uh, we write sentences. If I ended with a particular word, the next word is not just dependent on that word, it's dependent on all of the previous words that I wrote. So we need to incorporate into this model some idea of context, some idea of the information that had been encoded in the model up until this point. So we're gonna introduce a new, uh, a new set of uh, information into the model that's gonna represent the context of the information up until this point. And so what is the context? Well, we're gonna use essentially the hidden representation from the last, represent the last generation step. So just to make this a little more clear, the way it works is we have an input word from the previous, uh, from the current time step, as well as the context vector. And we're gonna put those together in order to produce a context vector for the next time step. And that, ne that context vector will be used to predict the next word in the sequence. So the current word, as well as the previous context, makes a new context vector, and that context vector is what we use to predict the next word in a sequence. And then we copy that context vector back and use it as input for the next prediction. So we can generate words on the fly this way using a recurrent neural network. So just to give you a sense of what this would look like, at the very beginning of a sentence, I have a context vector. There's no context, so we started with just something random so that we get different sentences every time. And we produce some probability distribution over what the next word might be. And to start with, the distribution is pretty flat because we don't have much information. So we're not sure what the first word of the sentence will be. We don't have any information. And then we observe that the word is hairy, and we get some feedback about whether or not we made a good prediction. So we can check to see whether the, the prediction for hairy was high or not. And then we use that word as well as the context vector together to produce the context vector for the next step. And at that next step, we'll make some prediction about what the next word is. And then we'll observe that that next word was actually had. And we can check to see whether we were right in our prediction. Did we actually predict had with high probability? Maybe we did, maybe we didn't. So so on, so, so on and so forth, predicting the next word and then observing it and then recursing. So, and as we do this, we can actually write, we can either write a sentence or pr uh, produce some uh, prediction about how likely a given sentence was. Uh, so this is an interesting model, and so somebody trained it on a huge corpus of science fiction data, um, and then produced a science fiction screenplay. Um, I really wanted to include part of the video because they actually filmed this, and it is hilarious, so you should watch it. Um, we're not gonna watch it right now but I highly recommend because it, it's hilarious because the, the actor is absolutely committed to the cause, even though the language is a, you know, it's not, you wouldn't fool any people with this language. Uh, in a future with mass unemployment, young people were forced to sell blood. That's the first thing I can do. So it's not like wrong, <laughs> but you're not, gonna, you're not gonna win any Oscars with this stuff. But it does have this dystopian feeling, right? Because it's trained on this science fiction data. Anyway, watch the, watch the video, it's really excellent. So what do recurrent neural networks have to do with the brain? So here we'll take some uh, Meg data, shout out to Layla, this is her work here. Um, we'll take some Meg data of people reading chapter nine of Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone. So one word at a time, uh, they'll read the words of this chapter, um, 0 0.5 seconds, half a second for each word. So this is not a free, free reading paradigm, they're, they're presented the words one at a time, so we know exactly when they start reading each word. And so we can ask where and when do these brain processes corresponding to the processes of reading occur in the brain? So the conjecture is to start with um, when you're reading a particular word in your mind, you have the context of all of your representation of what you've read so far stored in your brain. And then you perceive the word at time t and you um, have some representation of that word uh, by itself and then you integrate that word into the context in preparation for reading the next word. So this sounds a little like a, a recurrent neural network, right? So we have some input word, we have some context, and we're integrating them together to make context for the next reading, as well as producing some output prediction about what we think the next word will be. So there's a parallel here. On the brain side, we have representing context, retrieving the properties of words, integrating that word into the next context. And on the neural net side, we have the context vector. Um, we have the word embedding or the word vector. And we also have the probability of the next word given the context, so our prediction about what the next word will be. So in our model, that's this pink vector, the blue vector, and the green vector. And for this probability of the word W, we're actually gonna just use a scalar value. So we'll just use 
how probable is the word that we actually saw at this time step um, predicted by our model? So this was learned on a Harry Potter fan fiction database. Uh, people really love Harry Potter, so this is a really big database, uh, 60 million words of fan fiction. And then based on these word embeddings that we learn, or Layla learns from uh, this data, we can actually ask what are the nearest neighbors for some vector. So the vector for Harry is nearby other character vectors, which makes sense because they're all characters in the story. So then once the model is trained up on this fan fiction database, we're going to get it to read chapter 9 of Harry Potter, just like the person is going to one word at a time and produce each one of these vectors at each time point. So at each time point, we have from the recurrent neural network an embedding of the particular word W that the person's reading, as well as the context for everything up until word W, as well as a prediction for that word W based on that context. And we're going to annotate each uh, example from the MEG data with these three vectors, or the two vectors in the one scalar. So we can ask as a, as a function of time, how well are we able to predict these different pieces of information? Um, so here, this blue line represents the context vector. So we're able to predict from the MEG data the context vector before the onset of the word. And then once the word appears here at time zero, uh, the context vector becomes less uh, useful and it drops off in time as other words are incorporated into the context. So this context vector actually has a connection to what people are actually doing in their minds when they're reading Harry Potter. And here's a, a picture of the MEG uh, sensors in the MEG helmet. Um, if you're not familiar with these plots, the nose points up, and the right, and right is on the right-hand side, and left is on the left-hand side. Uh, I know these plots are small, so we'll, I'll enlarge some of them. Um, and then, uh, so for each one of these plots, we have a blue and a pink line, as well as a green line, which is hard to see in most of them, that correspond to the context, the embedding, and the probability of the word W. So one thing you can notice is that as we move forward in the brain, um, this, uh, the, we see the context vector all over, which is interesting, but we see this embedding of the word W, so the word W without any context. Um, it appears um, at the back of the brain first, and then as we move forward in the brain, its appearance is later and later. Another interesting uh, fact from this study was the um, existence of this probability of word W, which is how surprised you are to have seen a particular word at this time, um, shows up in the two temporal lobes, um, which if you're familiar with language in the brain is uh, where we would expect to see a surprise uh, signal, um, because it's where we see the N400. The N400 is an example of a signal that shows up um, when you encounter a word that is not semantically predictable from your context. And so that's exactly what this scalar represents. It's, it re represents the probability of the word W. So if that probability is high, you won't be surprised by the word itself. But if that probability was low, then you were surprised. And so that's why we're able to predict the probability of the word W with high uh, confidence at the temporal lobes. So there is a relationship Sorry, my computer is getting slower and slower, which is very scary. Um, so there is a relationship between RNNs and the brain. There's something about the way that we read is correlated to the way that this RNN is reading. Uh, so there's a caveat here. If all the, er the neural network is trained to do is to predict the next word, is that actually what we're doing when we read and generate language? Probably not, but it's at least some portion of what we're doing because when we read and we encounter words that we weren't expecting, we do have some surprise. And so there's some relationship between some of what we're doing when we're reading and what recurrent neural networks are doing. So we talked about three different um, skills that a robot would have to have in order to be a robot student. Uh, perception, the representation of knowledge, as well as communication via language. And all I talked about was neural networks. So is artificial intelligence neural networks? Well, of course not. Um, there's lots of other models in artificial intelligence, and we just don't have the time to talk about them all today. Um, but it certainly is the flavor of the month. There's a lot of work right now on neural networks, and so uh, it makes sense that a lot of people are trying to find where those neural networks, what those neural networks have to do with actual brains. And now I promised you that I would take my moment here with this soapbox to talk to you about bias in AI. Um, so I. If you take the word doctor and put it into Google image search, um, you see that most of the images that are returned are men. They're also mostly white men. So this tells you something about what Google image search is doing and what the data that powers Google image search shows, right? 
You see a similar, a sort of similar thing if you put nurse in. If you put nurse in, you get back mostly women. So this shows you that there is a bias in artificial intelligence. There is some um, predetermined biases that exist both in the data as well as in some of the algorithms themselves. So recall that word vectors can be used to solve analogy problems. So for example, Paris is to France as Tokyo is to Japan. So let's do some other examples. So father is to doctor as mother is to... You don't want to say, but nurse might be a good, good guess, right? Uh, man is to computer programmer as woman is to... Yeah, I know, right? But you're wrong. <laughs> That's not the answer that the word vector says. Uh, it says homemaker. Yes, that's the appropriate reaction to that. Um, so, you know, the, we maybe shouldn't be surprised that our, the data we use has bias, and it shows up in our models. So the data has biases because people have biases, right? Um, so should we care? Maybe our models should be as biased as our as people are. Well, I'm going to say that that's probably a, a dangerous assumption to make. Um, these biases are harmful and can be, even be deadly if, if they're perpetuated. Um, so for example, face recognition software works better for white people than people of color. So if police officers who are predominantly white use them to, on each other and notice how good they are at predicting, doing face recognition and doing uh, identity prediction, um, they might think it works as well for people of color. And then when they go out into the field, they might think that they can use these algorithms with the same effect, effect, uh, effectiveness on this different population. It's not true. There was also an example of people using um, per, these artificial intelligence algorithms to decide parole as well as sentencing. And those algorithms were uh, disproportionately uh, assigning risk to people of color, even when it didn't predict future recidivism. And so it was actually impacting people's lives. It is dangerous to assume that uh, we can use artificial intelligence um, and assume that it's fair. But So maybe if the model was only as biased as us, at least it wouldn't be doing worse than we are. But it turns out that these models are not as biased as us. They're even more biased than us. Um, so for example, there's a, this is a different uh, example, but the activity cooking was 33% more likely to involve females in a particular data set, but then it, the model itself amplified that bias and showed the disparity to be 68%. And so that it's not just that these, these models are as biased as us, they're even more biased. So this is a topic of interest in artificial intelligence right now. And if it's something that interests you, there's a workshop that's held yearly called FATML. And I have a few links here about some, uh, some good articles about this uh, topic. So with that, I'll thank you. And uh, this has been a great conference. Thanks very much.